Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and, and I am the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Today, Kelly O'Neill and John Ladley will discuss data lake architecture. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DI Analytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today, Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management. Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she first founded San Francisco Partners in early 2007. John Lally is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management with 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. John frequently writes and speaks on a variety of technology and EIM topics. If his information management experience is balanced between strategic technology planning, project management, and practical application of technology to business problems. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's web webinar started. Hello and welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Shannon. Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. And hello, Kelly. And uh, let's get started. We have a lot of yes. stuff to go over here. Um, we're going to uh, set the stage a bit with a little bit about uh, Data Lake. Uh, we can't talk about architecture unless we talk about what that architecture has to do. Uh, and benefits and risks. Um, we have a, a kind of a reference architecture of our own we want to cover. Um, there's the lab and factory aspect, which uh, I mean, by those words alone, you kind of get a sense of what we're going to talk about. And uh, a little bit of a dive into some of the tech that goes with this, uh, uh, not super duper deep. Um, we're not here to uh, survey uh, vendors or anything, but it's good to know that there's some things out there and some categories and of course, uh, an architecture needs to stay together. We'll keep, we'll take away, um, uh, well, we'll have a takeaway. I'm sorry, I read ahead of myself. We'll also have the, uh, the governance components and in times for uh, questions and answers. And let's just get started. We have our usual polling question because we'd like to know where you are and what you're thinking. That actually helps us real time uh, during our event here to, to uh, help uh, direct uh, our content. So do you have a data lake, yes, no, or unsure? Please, uh, with that poll, answer that uh, question. And uh, we'll, uh, and then check the box. Um, and then if you do have one, um, uh, let's talk about the usage, operational or regular use, or it's informal like a lab or a sandbox, or if you're not sure, uh, just check that box as well. And we'll uh, go from there, and we'll take a look at those here in just a moment. In the meantime, moving ahead, the definition of the data lake. We've got a couple of definitions here, plus kind of our own. Um, a storage of instances of various assets, that's one thing. You know, it's, think of it as single stream recycling. Everything goes into one bucket, right? Um, uh, so it is going to be by nature unrefined and raw, uh, but it allows you to explore um, uh, uh, the Gartner Group uh, definition is um, uh, key on the exploration and the system of record uh, compromises. Our own addition to these definitions is it can support either an exploratory uh, use of analytics or an operational use as, as uh, well. Um, and Kelly, welcome uh, in, in bringing you in here. Anything to add on, on, on that one? Mm -hmm. uh, nothing to add on that one. I think that the poll has finished. Do we want to see what people said for their answer? Sure. Yeah, let's take a time here. We got um, a lot of unsures. Well, uh, 
most of the people that did answer do not have a data lake, and therefore that did not follow into the last question. And then, as usual, a bunch of people just uh, um, uh, too shy to respond, which is okay. So we're, we're dealing with an audience that is, uh, I would say, Kelly, um, we're going to make an assumption here, maybe light on Data Lake and looking to, to uh, hear more about it. So we'll, we'll, t we'll uh, use that yeah, as our context going forward here. That's Sound great. good? All righty then. Well, let's just talk about yeah, that the benefits. Yeah, that sounds great. So benefits. Um, uh, Kelly and I are going to you know, talk through this stuff uh, t uh, uh, together, um, and this is really um, both of our insights versus tag team or, or taking turns on slides, it's, that can get just tiresome. Um, productionizing um, advanced analytics. We talk about advanced analytics, but the more and more deeply embedded they become, uh, the more we want them to be regularly uh, accessible, right? Um, then uh, cost effective. Uh, who out there, you know, I can't see anyone raise their hands, but you have a data warehouse, you have operational data stores, you have data marts, uh, departmental spreadsheets, and it's, this stuff can get expensive. So we have a, a, a keen business benefit of cost of ownership going down. Of course, the value from all the different kinds of data that you can put in here. And um, this is going to reduce not only just your usage of data, but also the whole ownership across all the data lifecycle, you're able to um, uh, take a look at raw data in all of its various forms uh, and, um, and shapes and, and sizes uh, within, within the data lake. That lack of having to structure it uh, rigorously uh, has a lot of advantages. Yeah, and I think when we think about kind of the concepts of the benefits of the, the data lake, it's really thinking about truly what are we expecting to achieve from that business perspective. So, yes, there's a benefit from aggregating data, aggregating uh, structured, unstructured, semi-structured sort of data, but really what is the true purpose? So what are we trying to get out of it and how is it making us more competitive, more um, uh, productive, uh, reducing our costs, increasing our revenue, et cetera. And so when we think about this third bullet point around deriving value from unlimited data types, there's a lot of different types of value that we can get. So deriving value might be um, uh, improving your customer experience initiative because you can now link the experience that they're having across across multiple channels and do some analysis around the way that they interact with you on multiple channels uh, by aggregating text-based data out of your call center um, with other sorts of more structured data that might be, for example, in a um, uh, you know, Salesforce automation application or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's really looking at what are those and business benefits that you're trying to achieve to push your business forward that would not be done in any other sort of way, that wouldn't be done in your data warehouse, that wouldn't be done in your operational systems. So creating a unique value from the actual cost and effort associated with implementing a lake. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and we have to talk this about this when we talk about architecture, right, Kelly? Mm -hmm. Because that architecture has to form mm -hmm. itself to those business benefits. Uh, also, the architecture needs to avoid uh, the risks. And these are fairly uh, typical uh, loss of trust. Um, I think we've seen several examples of that in, in our practice where the data lake exists and then goes, so what? I still don't believe your numbers, right? Um, the loss mm -hmm. of relevance. Right, and um, and then of course you have the momentum. Everyone is very excited. Here we go, something new. We're going to get to our data, and uh, it just kind of grinds to a halt. Uh, there can be risks of the wrong answer coming out, even though you think it's the right one. And then there's the excessive costs of uh, a lot of folks are investing a lot of money in these types of technologies and not getting the return for it. We're beginning to see uh, Kelly. I think you can echo here. We're starting to see more and more mm -hmm. uh, client examples and uh, also in the trades um, of, you know, this isn't working. We're not having the successes we looked for, right? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think as a 
a result, though, people are also being a bit more thoughtful about the, the lake and recognizing that it can become a swamp. So they think about what is our purpose and what is the cost that we're willing to incur as a uh, aligned with that goal and that purpose. So, so it doesn't end up being long-term excessive cost or increased risk as associated with it because we understand the purpose, the unique value of a lake, the differentiated value of a lake versus other systems we already have internally. As opposed to it just being uh, something that our competitors are doing and therefore something that we also want to do. Yeah, the whole Me Too thing. Yeah, the, the, yeah that Me Too thing. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of Me Too, thank you for that segue. Uh, reference architecture, there's lots of them out there. Um, mm -hmm. But we have kind of a, a take, a, a more modern a reality uh, a, a, on this. Um, and that modern reality has shifted even in the last few years on, on the data lake. And, and there's some reasons for that. Um, uh, there on your slide, and then it's just the technologies themselves have advanced very, very rapidly. And whereas the lake would consist of just this place in uh, Hadoop where stuff lands, um, it's not really that simple anymore. So our first uh, direct comment on the data lake architectures, there's actually three areas of a lake that you strongly need to consider, we'll talk about each one, the landing zone, the standardization zone, and the and the sandbox, the analytics type sandbox. And of course, we've got some things surrounding that, which we're going to get into uh, uh, as well here. Um, the landing zone, kind of closest to the original thing where we talk where everything just kind of lands there, uh, uh, hence the term landing. Um, see, aren't we creative? Uh, and then the where it's the raw data is now, Raw data is important, right? If you're a data scientist, uh, you're going to want to go after the raw data. You don't want anything, any additional context put on that to disturb your analytics. So it's available um, at, at that point. And Kelly, we see we see that still pretty popular element of the data lake, right? Yeah, and I think the point, um, uh, another point we're trying to make here is that. Originally, a lot of data lakes were formed just as the landing zone. And exactly. so some organizations have made it more sophisticated beyond that. Um, but some organizations are still using it just as that, you know, literally landing zone where the raw data is stored holistically versus moving into some more of the sophisticated components of the architecture. Yeah. And then next, and, and we've seen this, we have this uh, – thing we referred to earlier in the year is the leapfrog effect for architectures. And that is uh, folks use the, uh, um, we're using the landing zone as a place to um, draw into other, other um, uh, technologies to get to the data, maybe even populate a data warehouse or something like that. But, but um, what was happening is you're trying to do all this work on the data to get it ready to use for somebody else and even put a schema on it or something while someone else is, 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 is rummaging about in the landing zone. So really, there's a standardization zone. And we're not talking separate physical instances necessarily here, but you do need a place where um, uh, some uh, pedigree can be applied uh, to the data, um, and it can be prepared for uh, consumption uh, or even the, the sandbox. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go from a landing zone to a sandbox or something like that. But, but this is a construct to, that allows for the, the, the administration of, of, uh, of this um, type thing. And this is where, um, Kelly, we've got some folks that uh, they populate their data warehouse from here, right? Exactly. Yep, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and we, we see this more now than we did, I don't know, even just two or three years ago as these technologies were, were coming about. And then we have the, the analytics area where the data scientist works to do the new models. Now, uh, to be clear here, this is where the data scientist works. If someone is going to do a sophisticated query with four or five dimensions and a year over year, that's not the kind of analytics we're talking about here. That would be something out of the standardization zone and put somewhere else where they could do that. This is the pure data science 
um, uh, type thing. Um, a characteristic here might be that the data stores in this are not even persistent. They come and go as at the whim of the data scientist. So there isn't anything really uh, even production uh, about this. It, 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 is very, it can be very, very ad hoc. It can be very, very um, temporary um, uh, with it. This is where some ideas are, 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 are set forth. Um, anything to add to our modern reality, Kelly? We'll move into some of the other pieces that wrap around it here. No, I think you've got it covered. So I think, you know, some of the, the uh, rather than thinking about this in isolation, what you're going into next, I think, is uh, super important to ensure that the context, uh, the business context is achieved. Yeah. So this entire environment is subject to data management. And, and, and Kelly and I are going to kind of tag team on this. You know, data management as in, um, uh, uh, knowing uh, where where it's coming from, uh, having an awareness, uh, uh, some level of discipline around the lake. Now, the reason being, we 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 don't want it to be a swamp, right? Uh, uh, and, and kind of within that um, area, we've got, of course, we have a governance aspect, which would be your rules of engagement around. Uh, the lake and, and the understanding of quality or the understanding of usefulness and then an operational standpoint because um, uh, uh, we have some, we have seen some really large lakes and uh, one thing we kicked around on a conversation on our team just in general was that a few weeks ago, Kelly, that uh, someone had to recover a lake and it they realized it was going to take an inordinate amount of time. And, and so there was a bit of an operational, yes. uh, a, 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 yeah, an operational aspect to this. I know some of you are thinking, well, wait a second, the lake, we just throw stuff in and that's what it's for. And, and, and that's the initial view we had. But, but, we're, but just to reiterate here, we're trying to tell you, these architectures have evolved into something that requires a little bit more than just totally informal uh, management. Um, you have your consumers, the scientists and the uh, various consumers, um, and yet, yes, the scientists are perfectly fine probably with the schema on read, but uh, none of the other consumers of this are going to be happy with that, and we're going to have some type of schema on load or some awareness of uh, origin, uh, some awareness of who can touch what, when, where, why, and how. Um, so we need to wrap some of these uh, uh, um, components uh, around the data lake. Anything to add, Kelly? We'll start to dive into some more. Yeah. Nope, you got it covered. Um, boy, thank you. Awesome. Um, just to review, we uh, this came from our one of our architecture discussions earlier in the year. When you're talking architecture with someone, and so those of you who are thinking based on our poll here, not everyone out there has the lake, right? And and or you just don't want to tell us about it, which which is which is which is fine. Um, uh, there's the form of the architecture, which is can people understand it? Um, so even if it is one big lump, it still has to be uh, understandable. And then there's the fit for purpose. So as it evolves, there's a progression. Um, your data lake won't stay the same. Uh, you could leave it like it is and strictly for data scientists and some organizations are early on and it's just some Hadoop sitting in the corner with some people sitting in the corner and they're just banging on it. Awesome. That's great. If it's successful, you're going to progress away from it. You can't, you can't help it. And so you have to kind of be ready, uh, be ready for that. So let's break down between the differences of the lab and the factory because understanding how they work will help you with your architecture as well. And we're going to kind of kick through this one really, really quick so we can get into some of the more deeper architectural aspects here. You know, and, and the real key is, 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 uh, is it a lab or a factory? Or are you thinking of maybe both? Because your architectural governance and the organizational aspects are going to change. And you have to, you know, and if you can, clearly identify if there is an evolution or that architectural progression we talked about. Um, or, you know, you might want to keep them separate. There is that uh, thing where, off to the side, we're going to load data, 
and then we're going to have another more uh, discipline where we 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 um, use the standardization and, and push it farther down for something, um, and that might even be in parallel uh, with this. Uh, but normally, it's going to go from the raw to some type of standardization, and then and then uh, on down the line. But either way, right, Kelly, it's um, purpose defining the purpose initially is really really helpful for sustainability of these things. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that this is a, a delineation that's important to consider because it does drive, like uh, the, sec the second bullet point says, architectural governance and organizational impacts. And so if something is just within the lab environment, it's treated one way. And if it goes into a factory or production environment, it's treated another way. It's very tempting to... Uh, you know, I'm using air quotes right now, productionalize your lab. Uh, and it's also very dangerous to do so because of the difference in the way that it is architected and governed. And so this consideration is something that, of course, would happen when you're setting it up, but it would also be something that we would encourage you to consider on an ongoing basis and to validate that, in fact, your lab isn't getting productionalized and that people aren't using the output of the findings from the lab in a way that is production versus the process of productionalizing that uh, finding or that process that did prove to uh, demonstrate business value. Um, so that temptation yeah. is always there and should be reevaluated and reconsidered um, because it's very easy and I've seen organizations just kind of create that blend and not really consciously realize they're doing it and then yeah. turn around and have a governance issue or some sort of regulatory issue based on the changes, on the differences. Well, um, I think a classic example here is the lab starts to get used on a regular basis because it's really cool. And the data scientists feel as though they're um, have being distracted uh, uh, by continuous exactly. periodic regular, re yeah, you know, and, and, and that's not yeah. our job, which, which is actually is an appropriate thing. Uh, just so you can help, a quick sense of perspective, I'm just going to go through these real quick. Um, when you're in that lab, you've got very limited elements as well. Um, you know, yeah, you're going to load it, you're going to land it, you're going to maybe extract it, you're going to have a, a, a primitive HDFS in a dupe. Uh, might be columnar, might even be graph uh, database, and you're going to get to the data somehow, and you're going to have some data scientists or data analysts around it. Um, but then you're going to also move forward, and when you start to productionize or get more serious, it becomes a factory, you're adding more architectural elements to it. All right, you might not add all of these here on our slide, but you're going to add architectural elements to that thing, and, and if you can just tell at a glance here, you don't have to read all of these, that there's a lot more to that. Well, that's what happens with this productionization and going with the operational or, 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 or the factory. The characteristics here, obviously the lab, because by its name, it's, it's experimental. Um, uh, it's flexible. Um, we, we haven't seen, Kelly, you know, we, we've had several fun uh, efforts where the documentation has been uh, remarkably uh, non-existent. Um, but still, it's been a useful product, um, um, uh, and it's run by the users. I think that's the key aspect here. We've actually had a client, uh, Kelly, you remember them, where they had two labs. They had one uh, in one analytics area and one in a business department that had popped up kind of in parallel, and, and then, then the two had to uh, start to work uh, together. But um, uh, both were incredibly uh, informal, so it's very, very, right. um, yeah, output-driven, right? Yeah. Um, go ahead, Kelly. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was going to say, and, you know, when it is a lab, that's absolutely appropriate, right, where you're seeing great work done in one area. You want to replicate it closer to the demand, closer to the users, and replicate it in another area and see how that can assist from a departmental perspective uh, in another group. So it's absolutely appropriate that that happens and, in fact, encouraged uh, as the uh, um, uh, different environments become more accessible, become more understood. Uh, 
Um, but it w it's important to, cons to in, uh, understand that the output may be different than the output from another organization because of the differences in understanding governance, uh, structure, architecture, et cetera, um, that is set up differently. So anyway. Yeah. Um, now, the functional thing is, notice I do say, say something here, or we say something. The result should be evaluated for relevance. Um, we, we have seen that the labs produce stuff that go, and they go, this is what it is. And due to a lack of context or experience, uh, 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 a lack of awareness of the business model, the conclusion that's been produced has been incredibly irrelevant, but presented as being incredibly relevant. Um, and uh, that's a very, very, that is what a formality with the lab that in, in light of all the other informalities uh, definitely has to be considered. Uh, of course, when you start to talk being more formal, now this, the factory, right, comes, comes into place. And that means that the requirements out of this environment uh, of the lake are directed. There, there are things that have to happen in certain ways, so regular output, um, and that might be associated with the business service. So that does not mean you're not running an analytical model. We're not talking necessarily about a production report here. What we are talking about is if you are running an analytical model that, that is that the results are highly reliable and the organization through some type of application of machine learning, AI or something, is going to respond to a model-based recommendation, that is productionizing the lake, all right? Which means you need all the rights and privileges thereof of something being a regular part of your business operation, That's which is a defined architecture, so you know the limits and, it's, and, and what it can or cannot do, the rules of engagement for using it, who can use it and who cannot use it and what can be believed and what do you not use that for. And then functionally, are we using, you know, our old friend data quality comes up uh, to bear here, lineage and metadata as a tool, big part of your architecture, lineage and met um, folks, we're still seeing you out there throwing up the lake and then saying we'll get to the metadata and the lineage stuff later and um, it's not helping, uh, dig your feet in and, 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 and insist on it, those of you that are in the middle of this. Um, scheduled access and loading versus the ad hoc, oh, let's just go get it and throw it in there over the weekend. Well, now you've got to time it. Um, publishing means quality control, uh, maybe even approval. And running the models on a scheduled basis means there's administrative and maintenance. Uh, what if that model runs for two days? right, ties it up. Um, you've got to build that into the fact that there's now a growing number of users uh, on, on the lake. I think I got most of that there, Kelly, but did I miss anything? No, you didn't miss anything. So I just make sure I'm off mute. You didn't miss anything, but, I did, but you did say something uh, quickly that I wanted to just touch on. The, oh, sure. um, based on a lot more sophistication, uh, the users of the output of a lake could be other systems, could be uh, other, uh, could be event driven. So it's not just thinking about a human consuming that output. Um, it, it is other uh, driving other activities potentially in operational systems. Uh, so that should be considered um, as you're structuring from an organizational and functional perspective. So I just wanted to make sure that that important statement wasn't missed. Thank you. Uh, and that's why there's two of us on these, <laughs> on these events, right? Um, so uh, some, some, <laughs> as so, some aspects of, of the environment, some more thing. Um, uh, um, we need to build our tools and products to get the data where it's supposed to be at the right time, um, still be able to experiment and not pollute the lake. Um, we need to bring things in rapidly. This I have never seen a data technology in the uh, now, uh, unfortunately, becoming decades of me in this business 
uh, where the latencies have not been driven down. Um, the early data lakes was, oh, there's some stuff loaded in there, and maybe six months we'll think about loading it in again, to now we're talking about, and we're going to go over some, uh, just a list of some of those uh, real-time type technologies. And then, of course, everyone wants uh, to get to it and use it and, and things like that. Um, th there's also, um, uh, I am, I, 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 while Kelly's talking, I do tend to look ahead at the questions, and there's one question I can address right now. Notice we have arrows between the analytic sandbox and the standardization zone. Um, what that means is you can learn something from the data scientists that's relevant to the other consumers. Therefore, you take that uh, awareness that what you've learned, um, and it could be machine learning or it could be just some relevant context you figured out, and you can impute that back into the standardization. So uh, that's, uh, that's what that means there. So we have kind of this base environment that, um, and, and what we're really seeing now is that the latency is driven down, 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 and, and streaming becoming more and more likely now. Not everybody, uh, Kelly, we talked to needs to stream, and they've asked if they should, but some, some of you just don't need to do it, right? Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's really what are you trying to accomplish and what's the impact and the cost associated with doing something that it may or may not be necessary for your, your business purpose. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that we all want to, there, there's an aspect of keeping up with the Joneses. Um, we all want to make sure that we're not missing something. Um, but uh, at the same time, over-investing in something where we're not sure it's, if there is going to be business value yet, we need to just make sure that we're allocating costs to uh, anticipated yeah. benefits and then revisiting, of course, if we're starting to see a change in that ratio. Yeah. So here's, I mean, not a pretty slide, not many pictures on it, but there's some, here's some real architectural aspects to consider. Uh, many of you have an operational data store or your data warehouse has been driven to an operational status over the years. Um, and you're thinking uh, to supplement your analytics with the lake. Well, the lakes can be real time and you can effectively replace an operational data store with this uh, landing area and a standardization area then to a, a layer of operational consumers. So one thing to consider with your architecture and uh, are you a lab or are you moving to productionized is, is there any chance that you are going to replace the operational data stores functionality that is operational reporting, low latency type of feedback into the business. And um, for review, latency, low latency means things happen quick, right? The time between I know something and I need to know about knowing something is low. That's, that's driving down the latencies. Uh, also, and as somebody who is always dubious about data analytics technologies and operational work, um, but we're still seeing this, and Kelly can uh, chime in here. Uh, she's been more involved with some of those efforts than I have, uh, actually. There's full CRUD operations going on now in some lakes, which I find, um, well, I'm not so crazy about that or not, but the technology's moving to, uh, uh, to support that. Uh, Kelly, anything to add to that one uh, or any of the, the speed and operational aspects here? Well, I think that, that what um, seeing uh, some of, some of the, the CRUD operation happening in the lakes is just another form of uh, testing and experimentation and pushing the capabilities of the technology or, the, or uh, determining whether it makes sense to uh, perform any of those CRUD operations operations in the in the lake for the purposes of that lake and so we're seeing all kinds of unique um, uh, processes that traditionally have been done in other sorts of systems being attempted in a data lake environment and that is that's the experimentation aspect of it which is all positive and all good um, mm -hmm. uh, and you know something that we're constantly learning from and the technology as it evolves enables us to understand more about those operations such that we can track, govern, and share the fact that those op 
operations have been done so that when we consume that data, then we have that understanding. Uh, just like in any other system where we want to have that uh, understanding of what's done to the data, not, not just the data itself. Yeah, and, and, and I think a clarification, a, a lot of instances, uh, and Kelly, please correct me if my, my interpretation of what I see or you've got a, a slightly different experience. Um, and for those of you that think, well, why don't these two talk to each other? I've been, I, I took two months off this summer and the business changes. So she, Kelly's been working on some stuff I was working on before I went uh, away for a few months. Um, most of the create and update are the results of interpreting the data and then creating some type of interpreted value or conclusion from the analytics or some machine learning and then making that available within the lake to other people. That's where that standardization area comes in is you can do that stuff in that area without messing with all this raw data, which you don't want to do, right? It's not that all the customer address changed, and so I need to put my new address in there. It's more more uh, accretive and, and enhancing of the data, right? Yeah, well, and you're creating, uh, maybe you're creating a derivation that has been used or yeah. consumed as part of another derivation or as part of another uh, activity. Yeah. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, so, so you're right. It's not cre It's not writing the raw record, uh, but it can. Uh, there is data that it is created or aggregated that is then reused within that lake. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, so it's enhancing, uh, uh, and from a creative standpoint, uh, Kelly already touched on the thing. Match your needs with the latencies. Now, there's a lot of vendors that are playing in this uh, very fast area now. Uh, we, 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 um, the three you hear the most about uh, without any thumbs up, thumbs down on anybody or anything like that, uh, Horton Works, uh, Detunity, and, and Splice, and they are all vendors that with the ingesting, the processing, and the consumption have various types of management. The point I make here is we just recently interacted with an organization that was really struggling with the management of things uh, of their of their data lake and their um, data science areas. And uh, they've been so immersed in the, the core Apache type technology, which we see down below like Kafka, Storm, Spark, things like that, that they didn't see that there's this third market now growing. Um, uh, another vendor that's not quite in the real time area, but, but, but is there with the quality and the management like Podium. Um, uh, there are a lot of folks and, and I swear every time I Google uh, some of this stuff once a week, there's another name on the list, right? Um, so there's a lot going on in this area. Uh, the, 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 the thing to recognize here is this is changing really, really fast. And a lot of the problems you're experiencing are being dealt with as you speak by someone who has heard about this as a problem and, and is trying and endeavoring to create a software product to help you manage that. Uh, the, the other technologies uh, well, within the realm, as I just said, were Kafka, Storm for the real time, and, and Spark for fast batching, which looks real time, but it's fast batching. But um, uh, those are all things that you'll hear about in, in, in this data lake real quick area as we become more and more uh, of a factory and we need to manor, uh, manage a more um, rigorous data supply chain. Uh, the, the key here is is you, you know, you are going to have some type of raw area. You probably will need some type of standardization area. You probably will definitely need a place for the data scientists to go. They may go to the raw area. They are, certainly are always entitled to do that. But a lot of times you want to give them something even more, uh, something that they can uh, uh, manipulate uh, off to the side, um, and, you know, in a pure lab type setting. So, so, uh, but there are technologies to help you deal with, with all of that out there, okay? Uh, let's see, I've lost my button to go forward here. There we go. Governance then in the data lake. Um, uh, some, some things you've heard about in the data lake governance and some things you may not have heard about uh, in, in the governance and uh, Kelly and I are gonna just talk about each one of these here for a, a little bit. The one area of data, govern, uh, we'll just go through the six here, data acquisition. Um, uh, are you allowed to get it? Where do you get it from? 
get it from where you're supposed to. If you're going to make this a factory, then there needs to be a rule on adding a new source to the lake. Uh, we, we recently uh, talked to someone who uh, had, was sourcing a data lake with COBOL source code because it had an incredible richness of hard-coded values in it, um, which I think was just pure genius. But that's a rather unusual data source, and someone uh, should, should know about it. Um, uh, the catalog, uh, well, what's it mean, right? We all know what a data catalog is if we're in this business. And then the types of decisions that are allowed to be made at certain points along the way. Uh, the uh, oversight of the actual analytics or the models. Oh. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, John, can I, can I just back up a second? Do we want to comment just briefly on the difference between a data catalog versus other sorts of terms used around uh, meta metadata types of things to help clarify, because if, um, uh, as we heard from the poll, a lot of this audience hasn't implemented a data lake yet. So uh, different, differentiating a data catalog from things like a business glossary and other sort of metadata, that might be a good Yeah. Thing well, and, and chime in here, um, you know, in the context of the lake, the catalog is, is well, it's kind of like the, the um, you know, the, uh, well, I'm dating myself here, but it's kind of like the Sears catalog or anything like that. So here's something that I really like. Um, what can it do to help me? Where can I get it? Uh, what might be the procedure to procure it? Uh, um, so it, it, it's that level of, of, of metadata. Uh, so it goes probably a step beyond just the definitional or the semantic uh, there. It's going to be more of also the location. Um, and it might even be the avenue that I uh, portray the, the lineage of that particular uh, aspect of, of the, the data lake. Um, anything to add to that one, Kelly? Yeah, I think the only other thing is that many times it's also uh, associated with data sets so that you can kind of see how the actual sets, what is within a data set. Uh, and then it's not as, um, specific or as uh, um, delineated as, you know, more of a data dictionary or a data or other aspect of mm -hmm. uh, metadata. And we're also uh, hearing the term data catalog as uniquely applied to data lakes, as opposed to applying the concept of a data catalog to a data a warehouse or what have you. I, yeah. I, I, you know, haven't investigated to understand whether there's that's a technical limitation. I would venture to guess that the vendors would say that there, there is no technical limitation, that the concept of a catalog is most relevant in the lake where the volume of data are significantly higher. Yeah, and, and it's something to point you to that landscape of because there's, so, you know, there can potentially be so much out there and just understanding, mm -hmm. well, that's another aspect of what's in the catalog is what's there. Right, mm -hmm. you know, and again, it comes mm -hmm. back to the, the, you know, what can the, I use? Yeah, the yeah, I mean, the old the old Sears catalog, you know, when you when you got it, you went over to Grandma's house and looked at it. It was immense, and and just understanding uh, where things were, and then understanding the color coding and and things like that of the edges of the pages, and that's that's that it. You know, that's kind of that metaphor of you know, where can I just go to look at this stuff? And and that's um, uh, 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 that's a powerful metaphor. Um, and I think that's why the word catalog uh, is there. Uh, the usage and the model production is it productionalization. Um, that's hard to say. Productionalization, uh, uh, pretty self-explanatory. You know, who's using it? What are they using it for? And we love a model and it's working great. We're going to run it every day or every weekend. Well, then that means some controls need to be put on it and we need to know what those are. And the governance folks need to make sure that that, that happens, right? Okay, moving on here. Um, uh, so what's going to happen with, with, with governance and uh, uh, um, of that? Well, the catalog's going to make it easy to find. Um, we're going to have our lineage out there so we can understand not only us, but the occasional regulator where things came from. Um, we will understand that it's uh, Described right, so I, if I want to reuse it for another purpose, I know that the context is appropriate for the other purpose. When we do make decisions around data, they are logged and communicated. 
And that's kind of a new thing. You know, we looked at it, we decided to turn left, and here's why we decided to turn left from what we've done. That brings uh, collaborative tools and workflow to this environment. So um, not explicitly called out in our pictures, but uh, if you've got something that uh, maybe is uh, Internet of Things and really cranking through some stuff and really directing production or consumer responses or something, you're also going to want to track uh, why you did the things that you did. Um, and then, of course, making sure we can all understand and identify uh, things. Uh, so um, I'll let Kelly uh, uh, chime in on some final thoughts on that, and then we'll move on to our last few slides here. Yeah, and, you know, governance can have a very um, sour viewpoint when it comes to the lake because of the sense of control and limitation and things like that. So when we think about governance from a data lake perspective, it's really about data understanding and data uh, uh, optimization. And then, of course, protection. Um, privacy and protection is getting a lot of press right now. So uh, I'm sure most folks on the line are, are doing something about it. But if we think about how governance can uh, ensure data understanding, that is a huge value to the folks that are using the data that's, that's um, created and, and consumed from the lake. Because if you don't have a clear understanding of what it is that you're looking at and, and why it's important and how it's right and things like that, then it's not you're not getting the value out of the lake in the first place. So. That's really the focus of governance from a data lake perspective. And I'm sorry, I've been talking to my mute button. So, um, uh, evolution. <laughs> I was like, oh no, do I have to take over? <laughs> well, actually, on this next one, we, we, we've, we've got a lot of um, voiceover on this slide. So, I, I, I think. We'll, we'll be, but we'll both be talking on this one. First of all, you know, you do want to evolve your governance components as well, and I think it's a significant part of the architecture. I'm, I'm quite sure someone is out there saying, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I, I want more tools and, and technologies and stuff like that, and, and by all means, they're out there, and as our, our series progresses, we'll get more and more into those, but the, the, these evolution of these governance components are, are what's going to make your architecture stick and work, because if you don't have it, uh, you're gonna start with one form of lake and, and someone somewhere is going to alter that without you knowing it. And once they alter it, then no one else will be able to use it. Um, or they're gonna add something to it and not tell somebody. And it'll be really juicy stuff that everyone could benefit from and no one will know about it. So it's really important uh, to do that. Um, so, you know, governance is required, but when we move to the 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 um, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the factory, okay. Um, uh, governance's role is going to change. It's going to change from you know it's appropriate use and we know things to this is legitimate. It's in compliance. It's verifiable. It, the, the, it's still doing good things for the business. So well, what do you think you would need to go from point A uh, to point B? Um, uh, things like, right, Kelly, you need a roadmap to go from point A to point B. There's, there's a pretty Absolutely. Uh, simple concept there. You're going, to, uh, you're going to change your data policies at some point uh, uh, along the way for, uh, for that. Um, uh, let's see, what else do we need here? We're going to have to maybe standardize some things. Uh, mm -hmm. Factory's a little ad hoc. Um, things can come and go. Um, if a lot of folks is cloud-based, so we'll add a little, we'll move a little, we'll try something. Um, we go into production now, we need to maybe uh, lock that down and get a little bit more formal with the infrastructure, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, uh, organizationally, I like to do, you know, the people process technology uh, Kelly, uh, we've noticed that defining roles and responsibilities around productionized lakes come in really handy. So who's supposed to do what with it mm -hmm. as time goes on, right? Um, mm -hmm. Centers of excellence. And what is the what is the change associated with going? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. yeah, 
yeah, our old friend change management, right? Um, uh, you're going from an undisciplined environment to a disciplined environment. The people that were really happy with the exactly. undisciplined environment might not be really happy with the disciplined uh, environment. Uh, centers of excellence, yeah. supporting people. Um, uh, you might need a group of people to just do verification. I mean, when you're moving back and forth between a, a, a lab or, or, or a, a, um, a sandbox environment and a standardization environment, um, uh, who's there to say that this is right and it mapped right and, the, and uh, understand the abstractions of the data that went on? Yes, you'll have tools to do that, but you might need people to help explain and, and uh, train that. Um, uh, another aspect of operationalizing anything are data controls, our old friend data controls. Um, if you operationalize something, do SLAs come into it? Uh, I, if folks that have heard me speak before, I'm not a huge fan of the, of the way some SLAs or service level agreements are used in our profession, but in other ways, you know, they are incredibly valuable in the operational world. Um, uh, Kelly, the last one, I think we touched on this earlier in the talk, business continuity, right? You're going to use this operationally. What it's in the cloud, but does that mean, what if your network goes down and you can't get to the cloud, then what? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, exactly. things like that. Um, uh, standardization layer, publish and subscribe versus just go get it. All right, uh, you know, all of those things that you hear in a data warehouse world or BI, those are all, uh, they all become relevant in this world as well. Like it or not, right, those parts of your architectures. Now, anything else to add? to those architecture elements, uh, Cal? No, I think we've gone through all of them. I think we got them so, all, I think uh, we got them all. all right. Yeah. Let's move to our takeaways. Um, then we have time for some questions. Well, no one's great, we'll have a few minutes for questions here. We started with the business right. benefits, right? Um, now, mm -hmm. we hear the traditional one, oh, we're gonna have access to the data, yay. But that's, that's that, don't hang your hat on that. Um, you're asking to put an architecture mm -hmm. in that a lot of people aren't going to understand uh, and find a hard time to deal with and navigate. Even people that are used to the warehouse or whatever, uh, there's some new things to learn here. So please, please, please uh, uh, have a way to justify that uh, so that they feel that their time invested is worth it. Um, maybe some additional risks uh, there. Um, the quicker you can get the stuff and the more stuff there is, the quicker it can go off the rails, I think. Um, as well, um, so don't be casual, um, not causal. We don't want to call. Well, yeah, you could be a causal approach, but the word we <laughs> meant to put in there was casual. And and uh, one of the, well, <laughs> well, we need our official intelligence is in spell checker is where we need our official intelligence. <laughs> so uh, a casual exactly. approach to <laughs> that. Um, <clears throat> how many people did this go through, and it still snuck up? All right, <laughs> and um, understanding that uh, mm -hmm. the architecture is um, uh, it's going to become a standard. Uh, this 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 kind of three area uh, uh, approach we've we've shown you is becoming pretty accepted in industry, and it's not just the raw lake as a data lake, but it's it's got some elegance to it. It's got some additional form uh, uh, to it. Um, uh, um, now, unlike the data warehouse, uh, we don't want to get into um, what is really a data warehouse, what isn't. Um, let's, have lear let's try to learn from that lesson of 20, 30 years ago and get away from the religious wars. It's supposed to look like what you need it to look like to get what you need done, uh, accomplished. Um, but uh, you're going to have various shadings within the lake uh, with the standardization area um, and the, the raw area and the, and the sandbox area and things uh, like that. Um, on the technology part, open, being open mind, like I said, uh, once a month the players are going to change uh, right now with the, state, with the state of things right now. And of course, we spent some time on this as data governance as a critical success factor. No matter how you view the lake, whether it's the lab or the productionalized factory, um, governance needs to be applied in some way 
shape or form. And I'll let Kelly add her last few thoughts here, and then we'll start to take the questions and, and answers here. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I would venture to guess that a lot of people on that answered the question that they haven't implemented a data lake yet is because technology is changing very fast. They're not sure exactly where to start, and it's unclear what the business benefit is going to be. Um, we have a client who is, um, you know, a financial services institution, uh, pretty cutting edge as far as. Uh, other sorts of technologies that they've implemented they have a very sophisticated way that they handle their customer experience. But they're, you know, again, I'm using air quotes because nobody can see me. Um, their data lake is in Microsoft SQL right now. So you could argue that that's not really a data lake. Well, it was suiting their purposes for the time. And as technology continues to change and evolve, sometimes the first movers don't have the advantage. So. It, I do think there's a great opportunity for folks who haven't implemented a data lake yet to learn from, uh, you know, whether it's bad press or whether it is just, you know, highly publicized failures, but things are evolving and changing and improving. So it's a great opportunity to really assess what do you need, why do you need it, and to budget for the fact that technologies are changing and to give yourself a an unused or unallocated portion that you know is going to be used at some point in the future because something else comes up. Um, so I think having that flexibility and adaptability and agility is very important to make sure that you are uh, getting the best that you can out of your lake. And yeah, so, so sorry, the last thing I'm so going to add um, is to, that this lake is really just one component of your overall data environment. And some of the capabilities that we walked through may actually be done in other parts of your data environment. So considering that you want to optimize your existing data environment and leverage what's working and then implement a lake to take advantage of some of the uh, additional volumes, uh, um, data types, et cetera, as opposed to thinking that it is a rip and replace. Yeah. And I'm Good. done. <laughs> oh well, well, no, you're not because we have questions. Um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> here, here, here's one. I'll let you uh, field this one um, because we've seen this architecturally mm -hmm. already. Can data flow directly from the landing zone to the analytic sandbox? Uh, in fact, I think a lot of lakes do that, but they they haven't implemented yeah. a standardization zone be because they don't know what standards to apply in the first place. So, exactly. Sure. Yep, yep. Now, remember, these areas we, we, we presented are kind of general areas. It doesn't mean that this is a, a, a dogma, all right? This is what works in many, many things that we see. Um, but uh, um, until you know what your standardization is, you might just be, you might just have the landing zone and be doing just and that could be your sandbox initially, uh, but as you, you know, again, there's this progression of architecture that you cannot avoid. We learned after the last 30 years that we just can't avoid. They don't stay simple, and they, they start to need to morph to uh, additional purposes. But if you do think you need to do that, uh, you pull something into the landing zone, there's no need to standardize it. Uh, there's no need to do it, and, but the data scientists could really use it. Sure, ship it on over. That, that doesn't matter. Um, so here's here's another view, uh, Kelly. I'll let you take the first crack at this one here, and then we'll we'll be out of time. What is your view on centralized data governance uh, when involved with one or more data lakes? Oh boy, uh, um, the centralization to decentralization <laughs> question 30 is seconds. really <laughs> such uh, company specific. I know. So, you know, there, there's always aspects of governance that are optimized through a centralization approach because there are efficiencies of scale and there are consistencies associated with, the, with that. Now, there might be slight differences in uh, those multiple data lakes that you have, which is why you ended up with multiple to begin with, okay? <laughs> and so understanding what that delineation is, where you are comfortable between the centralized versus decentralized, Centralized. That's just that's a long answer, but um, a blended yeah. model is generally uh, acceptable and most effective. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. We have an awful lot of questions. This has been a huge event. The questions are still kind of actually banging in here. So we're going to have to, uh, Shannon, back to you. Uh, to wrap this up, we'll have to uh, uh, do what we've done a few times before, which was address all the other questions in writing in some way and then ship them out to everybody. Uh, so, Shannon, back to you, and thank you, everybody, for your time today. John and Kelly, thank you so much for this great presentation, as always, and thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I, you guys know I just love yeah. that. I'll that and the questions coming in. Um, <laughs> and as John mentions, I'll get those questions over to John and Kelly and include it in the follow-up um, email, which will go out by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording of the session as well. And I'll leave it open for a minute if you want to keep adding some questions in there um, for me to get over to John and Kelly. Again, thanks to everyone so much, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all.